Empire bids you welcome to East European Comic Con 2016. I need to take a test. Raise your hand if you can understand me. Yes, after five years, a sound system that works. Thank you to East European Comic Con. somewhere okay thank you to East European Comic Con for this opportunity we are starting our day with the panel devoted to Romania's Star Wars fan club please welcome to the stage Club Star Wars Romania doing the rest of this without the mask because apparently the sound system is still not what I expected it to be so it's better if you hear what I say than how I look at least in my opinion that was my 10 seconds duty as host and now I'm here as a member of the Star Wars fan club so we are going to let everyone get settled and allow them to introduce themselves. Hello? Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me? It sounds like it. Thank you, Ken, for the intro. I'm Andre. My Star Wars name is Toran. I'm a Jedi Master in Club Star Wars Romania. I'm a member of the council as well, which uh, makes me a very fortunate man. I'm here uh, with all my club members and uh, our honorary member, Ken, which is currently fiddling with some things. We're here to I'm tell you a little bit about our club, uh, how we got founded, what we do, and what our plans for the future are, how you can join, and where you will be able to see us. Joby? He's no good to be dead. Hello, uh, let me take this mask off. Hello guys, uh, my name is Mihai. Uh, I'm uh, Jeremy Bullock. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm uh, Boba Fett. Um, I, enjoyed the, I enjoyed the club like uh, three years ago. Uh, it was uh, and it is a fun thing what we do here. And um, I'm glad to be a part of this fan club. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Julia. Uh, I am Sabine Brand today. Uh, uh, I'm new in this club. Right? don't know what to say. May the force be with you. Hello, my name is Andu. I am Darth Maul without makeup. I got on the costume today, sorry. Um, I hope you like this panel and see you in the next Comic Con. Hello, my name is Mihai. I joined the club uh, last year uh, and I very much enjoy being Kylo Ren. Hope you will all uh, of you enjoy this, uh, this convention and uh, that you will remain with uh, some very good memories about uh, Star Wars and about the club. Thank you. Hello, my name is Robert. I'm a Star Wars enthusiast and cosplayer. I enjoy making costumes and I recently got into Star Wars uh, costumes. And uh, may the force be with you. 
Hello, uh, my name is uh, Darth Reyes and I'm a Siddler, the Deciver. And uh, this outfit uh, are uh, Anakin Skywalker. And uh, welcome to the party. Hello, my name is Solo Han, contrabandist. Okay, so it's uh, Radu. Uh, I am a member in this club since 2009. This is actually my first time to Comic Con. I've never been to Comic Con either in Romania or anywhere else. So it's, uh, it's a big pleasure for me to be here and to see what this is all about. Uh, I don't know if my colleagues told you a bit about this club, but this is the very first fan club uh, ever founded in Romania, okay, except uh, football clubs like Steaua. Uh, also, this club is the, the only official club uh, recognized by Disney and the, the movie producers. It's the only fan, cl fan club uh, they communicate with. Uh, what our activities about? Well, our activities are about charity, most of all. Uh, our projects are mostly with Disney, and since our last, our last activity for uh, May the 4th this year, uh, we can add UNICEF to our board of partners for charity. Uh, what our targets are, uh, the 501st and the Rebel Legion, we really want to be able to enter these clubs and also although we know um, that we need to meet some, uh, some requirements, we are on the way. And thanks to Ken and our members for, for wanting to be there. Thank you. We would be neglecting our duties if we didn't mention one more important member of the club, specifically our founder, uh, Dr. Alin Apostol, who is actually a medical doctor and he is on duty right now as we speak, so he couldn't be with us here, but because we know this is going to happen from time to time, we have a short video of him speaking his piece as a member of the club. We're going to run that now. It's in Romanian. I don't think you guys will mind. So if we could have video number one, please. <laughs> Sunt Alia Policoropian, maestru Jedi, membru fondator al clubului Star Wars România. Din păcate, eu nu am putut fi alături de voi acum, și, da, pe de altă parte, vreau să fiu ca hologramă și să vă spun câteva dintre lucrurile pe care noi le-am făcut, dezideratele pe care le avem în continuare și de ce suntem noi cu Star Wars România. În 2003, în anul 26, după bătălia din Yavin, s-au întâlnit doi pasionați ai realității Star Wars, eu și maestru Docasto. Și ne-am propus atunci să facem o adunare a tuturor celor care trăiesc această, acest univers Star Wars în viața de zi cu zi. Și atunci am pus bazele clubului Star Wars România, Apoi s-au adăugat nouă maestri în vechi lor din Chrome și Falcon și astfel s-a înfăptuit primul Consiliu Jedi în noiembrie 2003. Mi-a urmat o perioadă tumultoasă cu multe acțiuni, cu multe întruniri și dezbinări, multe lupte, la fel cum se întâmplă peste tot. O parte din membrii au trecut de partea întunecată, alții au revenit. Bineînțeles, dintre noi și-au vărut coada vânătorii de recompensă, contrabandiștii au fost întotdeauna de partea noastră și ne-au susținut. Au uh, intervenit uh, interferențe din uh, exterior, am reușit să le cupăm cu ajutorul forței și putem spune că acum revenim în forță 
și așteptăm cu toții noua premieră Star Wars. Dar un lucru trebuie să fie bineînțeles. În clubul Star Wars România, toți membrii au un numitor comun. Pasiunea pentru universul Star Wars. Forța fie cu voi. For lack of a better word, Aline really is the force uh, that keeps the foundation of the club together. Um, you know, there are people who do costuming for fun and for entertainment and for the good that it does, but uh, this is a gentleman that really tries to live with the concepts set down by the force and the mythos of Star Wars and incorporate it into uh, personal life, professional life, whenever you can. That actually leads us to another video that we'd like to get out of the way. Uh, this is one that I made, and since I never pass up an opportunity for self-promotion, it's actually one that I made about a year ago for the May 4th International Star Wars Day last year. I think it's still very appropriate. And uh, it was generally, uh, what does Star Wars mean to you type thing. You guys may have seen this on my YouTube channel, but if you haven't, then that's why it's up here. So. That's going to be in English. We're probably going to finish the rest of the discourse here in English, if that's okay with you, just for my own sanity. If not, raise your hand. They can take over in Romanian. So let's get video number two. Hello there. My name is Ken, and I have been asked to help a Star Wars noob understand what the franchise is and what its appeal to fans is. So the first step to being a Star Wars fan of any magnitude is don't do this. This is a hand gesture associated with a character of Mr. Spock from an altogether different science fiction franchise called Star Trek. This is Star Trek. This is Star Wars. Star Trek. Star Wars. Star Trek. Star Wars. Roddenberry. Lucas, 1967-1977. You get the point. Doing this in the context of Star Wars is the equivalent of bringing a cat to a dog show, or a football to a soccer match. And yes, they are two different things. Or talking about desperate housewives when you mean real housewives because, oh well, they both have the word housewives in it. So just don't do this. It hurts our eyes when you do it. If there is a consistent hand gesture in the Star Wars universe, it's this. <laughs> If you want to perfect a Star Wars hand gesture, come to me, we'll fix you right up. Star Wars fans come in all ages, sizes, professions. There's as much about them that's different as there is similar. But when convention time comes around, TV news likes to pick out the one fan who's gone a little bit extreme and use him to paint all fans as retarded outcasts living in their mom's basements. And who laughs loudest at this quality journalism? Why, the completely normal sports fan. The completely normal pet owner. And, of course, the completely normal hobbyist collector. Yes, when it comes to sci-fi, hilarity, and hypocrisy go hand in hand. And now to the point of this. What Star Wars means to the fans. I can't speak for every fan, so here's my personal story. I'm sure the vast majority of you watching this never lived in a world without Star Wars. But as one of Generation X's finest, I waited in line with my dad to see the very first film when it came out in theaters in 1977. I wish I could convey the wonder of that moment, but there's no common frame of reference. Still, that won't stop me from talking about it now. A lot. In the beginning, I was a handsome baby. Today, you can clearly see I am a very handsome adult. In the middle, not so much. This is the face of someone who spent his formative years pretty much on his own. He didn't get picked for sports teams, for school plays, for social events. He got picked on a lot. People like this were the original nerds way before it was cool. Nerds! 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 And we tended to develop mostly solitary habits, primarily reading, primarily science fiction, because it provided an escape from our unpleasant reality like no other genre could. Mainstream entertainment used to tap into this escapist need, but the Disney-style movies and Flash Gordon-style television shows gave way in the 60s and 70s to harsh, gritty dramas about cops, robbers, war, lawyers, and other depressing topics. On TV, Star Trek tried its best to revive science fiction, but it disappeared with the hippies 
Comics, and in 1977 it had yet to be reborn into the massive franchise that it would later become. This meant that by that time, the market and the public were extremely ripe for the return of quality escapist entertainment, and much of Star Wars' initial impact comes from the fact that it just appeared in the right place at the right time. A global phenomenon, a dawn of a golden age in science fiction films and TV, that's all a matter of record. The emotional chord it touched with the planet is also the chord it touched in me. Here was sudden and explosive confirmation that someone else wanted the same thing I did. Something better than a childhood of being bullied and an adulthood full of gasoline shortages and Vietnam fallout. One man said, hey, watch this for a couple of hours and feel better. And brother, did we. Not only did we watch it, we wanted to live it. Fans started to connect with other fans and discovered that yes, other people think like I do. I'm not alone. I'm a sad escapist geek, but so are these millions of other people. And with so many nerds finally interacting, you can't help but eventually develop communication skills, social skills, or at least coping mechanisms. Long before the internet and its dubious methods of doing so, Star Wars was the first means of discovering that no matter how isolated your existence may appear, there are always others somewhere out there who feel the same as you and will accept you. Yeah, seven minutes, boy, can I talk? Star Wars taught us that it's okay to concentrate on something besides our hollow home life, our oppressive jobs, our fake friends. Sometimes a better world is just a dream away. I don't know if you were expecting such a philosophical answer, but Star Wars was the gateway to my reasonably and surprisingly well-adjusted adulthood. I am an accomplished prop and costume maker, thanks to the technical allure of industrial light and magic Star Wars technological wizards. I'm a confident and comfortable public performer who learned how to deal with the types of dickheads that bullied me in my youth, thanks to the social camaraderie and acceptance and sheer numbers of fellow fans who share my feelings and interests, something initiated by Star Wars all those years ago. So there you have it. Of course, I collected the toys and the books. Of course, I dressed up like the characters. I still do. Yeah, and okay, I still collect the, the toys too. But that doesn't explain how Star Wars has endured so passionately after almost 40 years when other, even higher profiting entertainment phenomena have come and gone. Star Wars was the big brother my generation never had. The big brother who decided that you were old enough to see his stash of playboys and open up a whole new world to you. But instead of centerfolds with stapled navels, the new world that this big brother showed you was full of exotic alien planets, mighty spacecraft, dashing heroes, fearsome villains, and mechanical robots more endearing than most humans. Most Star Wars fans live comfortably in this fantasy world and our real everyday world, understanding that there is a time and a place for each. The very best fans can use each world to enrich the other, helping them improve their daily lives with the childlike sense of wonder that Star Wars gives to everyone willing to accept it. I like making videos. Uh, that first part, I invited, um, there was a large contingent of Star Trek fans in uniform uh, that I met yesterday, and they were going around all night doing this. So I invited them here to see this video just so we could troll them a little bit with that beginning part. So no hard feelings. So now we continue our panel discussion. Um, I actually hadn't thought things through past this point, so. It's going to be a little bit of improv, but um, we're going to turn the microphones over to anyone here at the table, or uh, conversely, if there are people in the audience that have questions about how things are done, or should be done, or haven't been done, let's have a nice uh, free form have at it. Thanks. All right. Um, I'd like to start off by elaborating a little bit on what uh, my colleague Radu over there said. Uh, you've already heard Aline, our founder, talking about how this club came to be in, in Romanian. We're always a little bit 50-50 on this. It's half Romanian, half English. It always depends. You meet people from this country that you always like to talk to in Romanian. You meet people from other countries that obviously you have to speak English to. The funniest parts always happen uh, when we go to conventions and events and things like that. People see us in the costumes, they think they're pretty cool, and we think they're pretty cool too. <laughs> they see us in the costumes, the first thing they say to us is something in English. They will address us in English, they will usually think we're from somewhere else. Which is really funny because it's a nice, awkward little moment where you don't know if you're supposed to say something in Romanian or English, and you start asking. 
So that's, that's, always, that's always fun to do. In our club, we, we try to tackle two big issues. One of them is obviously the promotion of Star Wars and the Star Wars universe franchise, the movies and everything that means. And the second one is charity. We use them as a little bit of a wheel. We use the first one, we promote Star Wars, and then we use the Star Wars universe and its popularity to promote the charitable um, actions that we do and organizations that we work with. So that's kind of how this works. It's a system that has been tried and tested a lot in, uh, in many countries in the Western area. Uh, Radu also spoke about the 501st and Rebel Legion groups. These are the international uh, Star Wars fan clubs, the official costuming groups. They have the highest standards in costumes. They will always be in character. They have rules upon rules about how your costume has to look and how you have to behave in that costume in any event. That said, they are very professional, but they are also some of the coolest people around. And uh, Ken here happens to be one of them, a uh, 501st member. So uh, maybe he can tell us a little bit more about that. Well, there's two sides to the 501st story. Um, BD and AD, meaning before Disney and after Disney. Well, the 501st was started, I guess, going on 15 years now, 20 years, I think somewhere around there. Uh, one man with one friend put together two Stormtrooper costumes. This is long before you could buy anything licensed. And started making charity appearances around their town. This was in the state of Georgia in the U.S. Local hospitals, local book fairs, local events that were, you know, that would benefit from celebrity appearances. Um, and apparently it just caught on. They told two friends, two other friends, and people started noticing that this was a thing. And uh, in other areas, other states, other guys started making their own costumes and lending themselves out to appearances like this, always for charity. You know, these are never paid appearances or anything for, for personal gain. Nobody complains if they give you a t-shirt at the end of things, but uh, there's nothing mercenary about it. So fast forward a couple of years, this has gained so much traction that it is a worldwide phenomenon. Um, mostly from stormtroopers because it's an anonymous white costume that fits a large range of, of sizes, of genders, of, of dispositions. Um, a lot of them are actually ex-military and ex-police, so apparently it's a good way for them to continue the whole militant look and feel uh, that they've been used to in their earlier careers. And they're organized in garrisons, in uh, outposts, in detachments, depending on how many people are members. Every country in the world, uh, and we're talking like every, the Philippines actually has one of the largest uh, detachments in, in the Legion. Uh, besides stormtroopers, the 501st generally embodies anybody in the Star Wars universe that's considered a villain. So Sith Lords, bounty hunters, um, just general dislikable people like uh, Sand People or Jawas or anybody like that. All very welcome in the 501st. You do have to meet a minimum level of quality and accuracy in the costume. Um, so that means you can't just go out, buy a brown bathrobe and call yourself a Jedi. So they have a level of professionalism and that has a reputation of being a very expensive club to join because quality does come with a price. But if you're also an accomplished craftsperson in your own right, you can build your own costume. If you have the right reference material, photographs, whatever, uh, you can build something that looks exactly like it came out of the movies. So it's not discriminatory. If you don't have the money to pay someone else to make you a good costume, you're perfectly willing to you know, build your own. It's uh, equal opportunity. After a few years of the 501st, all of the people who wanted to play good guys, like Jedi and, and royalty and senators and so on and so forth, decided, well, why don't we have our own club? And they started a sister club called the Rebel Legion. And that's where you have your fighter pilots, your Jedi, your good guys out of the universe. And they have pretty much grown to be an equal and opposite 
but in a very good-natured way because um, whenever you, there's an event, you'll see both organizations contributing and cooperating. So they really do embody the spirit of what Star Wars fans should be in terms of using the franchise uh, to make life and the, and the world a better place. So with all of this reputation, the 501st um, eventually inherited the title of being Lucasfilm's preferred costuming group, uh, which meant that actually Lucasfilm acknowledged the 501st and the Rebel Legion as a quality group of people with quality representation. And it got to the point where when Lucasfilm needed to have an event, if there was a parade or a televised event or the Academy Awards, they would actually call their local franchise or the local headquarters of the 501st and say, hey, we need 50 stormtroopers on Saturday. Can you? And we're always happy to do it. Any excuse to dress up. And then along came Disney. And I don't, I'm not going to pass judgment on whether they've done harm or help to the Star Wars franchise. To the average observer, there's really not that much of a change. But one thing you can say about Disney is that they like to control their franchises. So one of the first entities on the chopping block uh, has been the 501st and the Rebel Legion. Uh, Disney has very kindly and diplomatically let us know that when it comes to large organized events, such as these parades or televised events or whatever, they would much prefer to use their own people and their own costumes. You know, they've got experience doing this. I mean, look at their theme parks with all of the Disney characters. So they know what they're doing. And I guess you can't blame them for wanting to take control and potential profitability away from the hands of civilians and bring it back into the company. So the 501st is still in spirit. Uh, a very desirable and very productive entity and uh, it's still a very good thing to want to join them. Um, I just won't be able to promise you that you'll get a lot of work once you're in there the way that we used to. Now, representatives of the 501st are continually meeting with Disney executives to try and get this balance corrected and bring back to uh, equitable states. So things change every day. And uh, I'm just personally griping at this point. Do not let this deter you, anybody who has the ambition to, uh, to join this club, because it is still something very worth doing. Um, on the subject of the 501st, while we're there, 501st and Disney, I'm curious about one thing. How many of you here uh, that are here at this panel, at the Star Wars panel, have seen Episode 7? If you could raise a hand. Okay, that's a lot of wow. you. That's pretty much everybody. Um, about 501st and Disney, I'm not sure how many of you may know, but there's actually a little... Easter egg that Disney put into their movie in episode 7 on the planet Taco Dana if anybody remembers it uh, there's this castle and this castle has quite a few flags flying around vertically one of those flags happens to have the 501st insignia imprinted on it if you look closely or if you look it up on the internet you can definitely find that sequence so while we're not exactly sure what Disney's plans for the 501st and us and other costuming groups may be, they still like to, you know, try and throw us a bone every now and then when it is possible. Ken, would you have any other subjects that you may want to approach? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I was trying to interpret some sign language over here. What? Oh, I know what she's talking about. Yes, actually, uh, I have to say Andre has a point there. The, the 501st does go through the gestures of meeting us halfway, um, especially where public perception is concerned, so I can't complain about that. Something else, um, what he's talking about, in case you're not like uber geek level that we are, <laughs> is the part of the movie where they land to go find Maz Kanata, the little orange woman, Han Solo! When they're walking up to her castle through the entrance, there's flags lining the doorway, and one of those flags has the emblem of the 501st. So I don't even know what the name of the planet was, so he lost me as soon as the proper names came out. But that's what we're talking about. Somewhere else in the movie, 
Um, and I believe it's towards the end when all the raids are finished and all the pilots have landed back at the base and Poe and Finn meet each other again and do the bromance thing. There's a small R2-D2 looking unit which is done in pink colors rather than blue. And that pink R2 unit is actually the mascot of the 501st. And uh, she was created, and we, it's she, because the actual designation of the droid is R2KT. Because it's named after a girl named Katie. Sad story, Katie was the daughter of uh, the gentleman who actually founded the 501st, and, uh, and she died of a cancer-related disease as a very young child, so they built the droid as a tribute to her, and uh, as a result, this droid now appears whenever possible. Uh, in official Star Wars capacity, and it's uh, it's touching, but it's also very sweet. So look for an R2 unit colored pink. Also has appeared in a couple episodes, or at least one episode of the new Rebels uh, TV series. So we caught that on um, by accident. So there are there are little Easter eggs. There are little uh, efforts between Disney and the 501st to stay you know cooperative and friendly. So. Again, don't listen to an old guy complaining about the way things used to be when he was a kid, because you know that never ends well. Uh, Radu, do you still have a microphone over there? Yep, I still have the microphone. Um, can we get you to talk a little bit about the club's organization and our ranks and structure? Okay, so uh, our club is pretty much structured in a, in a really good way as in we have ranks to which you can um, you can build your profile up as you as you advance through through your membership so for example when you enlist in our club you come in as a padawan you have any privilege any other member has but you don't know where to start or what to do or what this club is about Nobody acts as a boss or something like that, but you find yourself not being able to do some of the activities because, because you don't know where to start. So you need a Jedi Master, like Andre over there, Toran, uh, our Master, Alin, who was on screen, uh, Master Trius as a Sith. These two guys I mentioned earlier are Jedi, but Trius is a Sith. Um, our club has the basic two factions, Sith and Jedi. Um, what happens after you enlist and become a Padawan or a Sith Acolyte? You are given tasks, missions. Missions like helping us put together um, an event, like a Star Wars party, like a Star Wars Halloween party or participate in a charity event, like for example the one we had for May the 4th at Spital Oncologic with Disney, where we need staff members to help us organize the whole set, to basically guard our stands if we have stands, or take photographs, or film like the guy in the middle with the camera. Um, he might be... <laughs> N not you, the one behind you, Iwana. <laughs> Iwana also, but I think she's also past the, the Padawan base rank. I think she's an honorary member or something. She's above all. She's like the um, mother. Iwana, Iwana is actually an honorary Sith Lord right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She actually I was going to say, I, I live with her. She went straight to Sith. <laughs> um, what happens next when you advance through your ranks? You become, you enlist as a Padawan, then you advance to a Jedi Knight, and obviously become a Master, but after some years after you manage to, to get some experience and already know what the whole club is all about, and basically you can use your phone to put together an event all by yourself and then come to your colleagues and tell them what they need to do and put together lists and basically have all the relations you need uh, in short that's all about ranks i think this is why i advise you to join the dark side it's much easier all you have to do is kill your boss yeah the the Jedi's are the one who put together the events, and uh, the Sith help us. 
Right, so basically we have to work for it. They just butcher people. That's all they have to do. And look nice on camera. <laughs> yeah, look nice on camera, obviously. Somebody, somebody very wise told us once, not actually us, the, she, she said this on TV that bad guys are cooler. <laughs> she, I think bad. everybody thinks like that, except us. <laughs> okay, so that, that's about ranks, but uh, I think we need to talk more about the events, about how we manage to put together events and um, how hard it is to get sponsors. That and a little bit about what types of events we've had and where. Okay, so. Okay, um, one of the main things about events here is knowing the um, nebulous situation with Disney. It's been a little bit difficult to get with them, but once we have done that, we've had a great many events with them. Uh, one of our feature favorites is called the Jedi training, the Padawan training event, where uh, big dark people like Ken over here or any of our other Sith Lords volunteer to get the shit beaten out of them by a bunch of kids. Uh, the good guys, meaning myself, Radu, and a few others, we just train them how to wield their stun batons and death sticks. And then we bring in the meat, the target practice, and they get banged on nothing repeatedly. Keeps you, nothing keeps you hum humble like a pile of 10-year-olds uh, beating the crap out of you with their plastic lightsabers. Oh, it's, it's absolutely fun to watch. All we have to do when that happens is just a pile of kids they go at them, they start beating on them with all those sticks. We actually managed to upgrade to foam lightsabers for the kids and our Sith Lords were very happy with that development. Especially my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Radu, Radu has a problem. The poor guy, he's a Jedi, but he's dressed in black. And kids, they don't look at saber colors. They don't look at you know, how they behave or what he does. They just see the black and they think he's the bad guy. So he's had a bit of action himself. Radu, can you tell us a little bit about the experience of having so many children beating up on you? Well, besides uh, the small fracture of discrimination there, let's beat the guy because he's dressed in black or he has something black or all black it's on It's racism. Himself. <laughs> okay, but it is actually fun to play with kids and uh, I didn't mind before when my face got smacked with <laughs> plastic lightsabers, but I can thank the one who had this, uh, this bit of imagination going on and said, let's upgrade to foam lightsabers. That, that helped a lot. Uh, okay, my face has it well, but also the costumes, because you can get plastic lightsabers against your face, and that's, okay, that'll heal. But then the costume might get smashed up and you might not find pieces you had before and you need to smash your head yourself to uh, rebuild. I but guess I, I shouldn't complain, at least I have armor. Yeah, Ken has the most experience with it. Oh, he has armor, but it's taken a beating itself. I mean, these kids, he can tell you, they're, some of them are pretty strong with the force. Yeah, but we can call them battle scars and just live with them, so... But, but as much as our Jedi training uh, event goes, um, Andre explained it as much, but didn't give it as uh, the justice it needed. It has a story about it. So uh, kids don't actually come learn some moves and then <laughs> smash the Jedi, smash the Sith, kill everyone, and, and after that leave. They don't? Uh, I thought that's what they did. <laughs> that's what they actually do, but they have a story, and it, it has a story for their parents as well because the event is, uh, is noted to Disney as being an uh, educational one for the kids, so the, the, you don't bring the kids and then teach them how to kill someone and that's it. Although I know Aline says, says it all with uh, <laughs> cap. He, uh, but the, the event has a story, you, bring, you call the Padawans the Jedi's go out and call the Padawans. They, they search for their future the younglings. The younglings come to the Jedi, they learn their moves, uh, and as their training goes on, there's a Sith who wants to ruin everything. And from time to time, we have Darth Vader, we have Kylo Ren, 
or we have trios as a generic Sith master who wants to, to ruin the training, or um, the usual generic Sith knight, uh, like we have our unpainted Darth Maul next to Mihai, next to Boba Fett. Um, and as they're sending the Sith away, because that's what happens, we, the Sith comes and uh, ruins the whole Jedi training event, the kids and the Jedi need to, need to send the Sith away. And after they send the Sith away, uh, you know from maybe from YouTube uh, what's, what Lucas does with Star Wars Weekends. This, is, this event is actually an official one like, like Star Wars Weekends because Lucas knows about it, Disney knows about it, and they're okay with it. They think it's exactly the same thing, and it is because we had a pattern on which to write it. It has a script the kid beating has a script. Uh, the educational part of it is uh, um, after the kids send away the Sith, they need to go home and maybe they don't know when they'll see their Jedi Masters again from this event. But we tell them and make sure that they know and this is scripted and it has a, a long story of, about it, that the Jedi Masters from Club Star Wars Romania appoint the kids new masters, their parents. That's the ending of the story about the Jedi training event. Right, that, that's, as you can see, that's our main thing. It's an activity we do with kids, with Disney. It's always a lot of fun, the kids always love it. I think it's mostly the lightsabers, not sure about the lesson. We try to work the lesson in there a little bit so the parents appreciate it, but you know. Um, other than that, we also do a lot of other types of events. Working with Disney, on one hand, we do the Jedi training most of the time, but we also work with uh, a lot of cinemas that roll the film and other people that are interested in, uh, you know, Star Wars events. One of these events, actually, uh, was outside of Bucharest. Our main body of the club is situated here in Bucharest, but we like to try and go out and reach out to the rest of the country, places where maybe there aren't as many members and we can bring some of our own to bolster and do a nice event. One of these events took place at uh, Vulcha and Chobi here can tell you a little bit about it. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm uh, the only member of Club Star Wars Romania in uh, Rumniku Vulcha and uh, I had an idea. Why not uh, come to Rumniku Vulcha? It was uh, like something new to the city, a small city and uh, the people there, most of the, and the children, especially the children, were very, 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 very impressed about this. Uh, one day I was, walking by, uh, I was walking down the street and a kid uh, stopped me. Wait, 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 you are the guy who, who trained us with a lightsaber. Oh, yes, yes, yes. When you come back to Rumniku Vulcaz, said, uh, soon, soon. <laughs> it, was, um, it, it was nice. Thank you. All right. Um, that was a little bit about Vulcha. And uh, we managed to wrinkle in a little bit of a charity event there yeah. with, uh, with a little girl from, uh, from that area. Uh, Chobi, can you tell us a little bit about her situation? Uh, yes. Uh, she, she came from a poor family uh, with uh, no... Uh, no possibility uh, to go to a movie or something like that. She never went to a movie, and um, we talked to the manager of the cinema, and uh, uh, we um, g give her some uh, tickets, Star Wars, uh, Star Wars tickets to the movie, and she was very, very, very impressed. So again, a useful gimmick that we do as i said we use the popularity of star wars as we did we went to the manager of the cinema we said look we're the star wars fan club we have um televisions here with us to film us and everything and using the popularity using the tv that follows us and the news that follows us we can bring that to managers and you know local business and ask them for donations in exchange for basically publicity and we use those their support to bring it into the charity situations that we can find. So that's kind of how the whole system of using Star Wars' popularity to boost charitable events works. 
that aside, I'd like to pretty much end the panel on... No, 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 wait, 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 wait. There's another thing oh, wait, to add buddy. about charity, but I'll go on about it in Romanian so we can have that a little bit of percent in Romanian. Nu știu dacă ați auzit despre campania Disney Force for Change, dar este campania de bază a lor pentru caritate. Iar începând de anul acesta, începând cu 4 mai, ziua internațională Star Wars, din 2016, Club Star Wars România este pentru prima oară reprezentantul principal Force for Change din România. Deci de acum încolo vom avea foarte des campanii de caritate cu ajutorul celor de la Disney. Și poate, deși ne recunosc și suntem oficial, poate nu vom rămâne la fel de obscuri pentru ei, având în vedere că noi suntem singurii care se vor ocupa de caritatea lor în ceea ce înseamnă Star Wars. Și de aceea UNICEF, Andreea Marin, este o mare fan, o mare fană războiul stelelor. Ok, Radu a avut un romanian mesaj aici pentru oamenii aici, locali, și asta este focusul ei. I would like to have a last message that would go out to everybody here, regardless of Romanian or from any other country. It's more of an international phenomenon itself, and that is geek culture, uh, nerdisms, and everything like that. I'm sure everybody that came here to this panel likes maybe more than Star Wars. Maybe they like some Star Trek. Maybe they like some video games. Things like these, as Ken's video said in the beginning, Decades ago, it was a very closed circuit culture. Everybody would have to kind of hide these hobbies, hide these passions, because they would be made fun of. We're living in a completely different age. At this point, we are pretty much the majority. All the, the people that like the superhero movies, the sci-fi movies, the books, the games, we form up pretty much the majority of the population at this point. We are now in a weird position where we sometimes become the bullies ourselves and that is something that in our club we've tried to evade as much as possible i think i i think man yes i, I was I, was, I read that in the i think it was in the bible the geek shall inherit the earth <laughs> this finally come through I'm going to wrap this up only because I see our cosplayers uh, starting to swelter backstage. So I'd like one last thing, though, from the audience right here. We've seen at least one Star Wars costume in here, which is a Yoda over there, if you can wave. And anybody else that has a Star Wars costume, if you can wave. Any other hands? I think I'm blind. There has to be something else. Well, if you don't have one now, now is the perfect time to work on it. It's currently a very good time to be a Star Wars fan. You know, there's been a dry spell. Uh, I've known this group since at least 2006, 2007, and they haven't always had the level of activity they have now. You know, thanks to the new films coming out, there's a whole new generation of costumes and uh, awareness, and um, even the old school characters are going to get a new lease on life thanks to Rogue One coming out, or as half the internet illiterally spells it, Rouge One. So Vader and the old school stormtroopers will also still be very relevant and very welcome and very much in demand over the next few months. So if you are thinking of getting on the bandwagon, now is the perfect time. Thank you everyone for uh, being very patient with us, letting us geek out on stage for a while. And uh, thank you to Club Star Wars Romania for a very informative and entertaining panel. So we are going to uh, give them, please, one big final round of applause. Mulțumim frumos pentru că ne-ați primit, pentru că ne-ați ascultat și rămâneți în continuare fani Star Wars. Yes. La revedere! Forța să fie cu voi! And, uh, We're going to kick him off the stage, and uh, I guess I will be presenting the cosplay uh, in costume, because I don't think I have time to get out of it, so that's going to be a lot of fun. So stay where you are, a uh, local cosplay competition coming up next on this stage. Um, you know, we're not uh, qualifying for any big fancy European contest, this is just good local work right here. So stay where you are, we'll be back soon, thank you.